If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Once again, to our program, I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Well, if you're familiar with our program and uh, this particular uh, video series that we're doing, uh, you'll uh, be well aware of the topic we'll be talking about today. The topic, the topic will be Roman Catholicism. Now, uh, I have a special, very special guest, and a great brother in the Lord with me today who's been on our program many times before. In fact, so many times before that uh, this is actually show number 13 <laughs> in a series of one-hour programs that we've been doing on Roman Catholicism. And uh, without further delay, I'd like to introduce him right now. Uh, Rob, great to have you here once again, brother. Thank you, Larry. My pleasure to be here. Show number 13. Hard to in, believe. In this series on Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. But I guess with almost a billion people involved in uh, the religion of Roman Catholicism, uh, I guess it's well worth the time we're taking to uh, really analyze this religion and see uh, what it has to say for itself mm -hmm. and uh, how does it stack up biblically, things of this nature. Well, uh, Rob, hopefully a lot of people out there are already fam well familiar with you <laughs> from all the other previous shows we've done, but uh, just for those people who are uh, tuning in for the first time today, why don't you uh, just give a brief introduction of yourself and tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Okay, thank you, Larry. For those of you who have not uh, viewed any of the previous videos, part of the ministry of Reformed Bible Church in Rutland, Vermont, is to be involved in an outreach to the Roman Catholic community, and I work closely with a national organization entitled Christians Evangelizing Catholics. Now, don't let that title offend you until you have had opportunity to hear why we have selected that as a title of our organization. We have done so based upon our analysis of the Roman Catholic religion and that which is the heart of Rome, that which Roman Catholics are taught to believe, and we feel that it is inimical to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and thus the name of our evangelistic outreach is Christians Evangelizing Catholics. And I think I've been at this about uh, two and a half, maybe three years, and have done some videos and television shows, and. Uh, we're in the process of finishing up my first book on Roman Catholicism, and uh, hopefully through this ministry, uh, everybody can see that there is a tremendous difference between what Rome believes, the gospel of Romanism, and biblical Christianity, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wait a minute, now that sounds, Rob, like you're, you're not just saying there, Roman Catholicism is uh, not just another denomination not just another Christian denomination. You're, it sounds to me like you're saying that there's something drastically different between just any old Christian denomination and the religion of Roman Catholicism. Absolutely, Larry. In the uh, indices of my book, I've devoted the first uh, portion of it to an unequivocal statement on Romanism insofar as its contradistinction to the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I'm involved in debates, for instance, oftentimes my Roman Catholic opponent will refer to me as his brother, or he'll say, well, we're all Christians, or we're all in this together, we just have different points of view and things like that. When I hear that, I cringe a little bit inside because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there is the gospel of Rome, a set of beliefs, a religion, and then there is the gospel of Jesus Christ, what he came and gave and delivered, which is the uh, depository of his truth found in the Word of God. And the two 
cannot be brought together as though they were different aspects of one religion. They are not. Roman Catholicism is a religion, it's a set of beliefs, it is a, a cradle-to-grave organized religious system which is uh, well documented in all that it holds to and believes to be true, and it does incorporate some truths from Scripture. That must be analyzed from the Scripture to find out what the true gospel is and if it measures up. And of course, we say that it does not measure up, therefore, it is disqualified as a gospel. So I am not a brother of a Roman Catholic in the sense of being a Christian brother. No matter how many times they say it, it cannot be true because we are saying opposite things about the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's sort of like, uh, let's say, a Jehovah's Witness comes to your house and knocks on your door. Uh, I, I would assume most of our viewers out there have had that experience. And I would think uh, a lot of them would uh, not really think, if they know anything about theology or, or the Jehovah's Witnesses, they wouldn't think that they are a Christian brother with Jehovah's Witnesses. Not to say we hate them or anything, but Jehovah's Witness teachings and doctrines are so alien to what we find in the Bible that you can't really consider them to be a Christian brother with you, even though you both use the same terminology like Jesus you know, the Bible and other terms, uh, Holy mm -hmm. Spirit, you know. Uh, but it, there's different meanings applied to those names. So uh, Jehovah's Witness, when he says Jesus, he means something completely different than, let's say, an Orthodox Christian would think when he thinks Jesus, uh, in case some of you out there don't know what I'm talking about, an Orthodox uh, Christian, Evangelical Christian, would believe that Jesus is the second person of the Godhead who is God incarnate, uh, God in the flesh, John 1.1. 1, 1 in John 1 14 whereas a Jehovah's Witness when he says Jesus he doesn't mean that at all he means he's the Archangel right. Michael and a created being not God at all and when you have a difference of opinion as to who God is <laughs> that's a pretty big difference exactly and uh, what you're saying from what it sounds like to me that you're saying there's a pretty big difference between uh, Orthodox evangelical Christianity in this in terms of the gospel and what Roman Catholicism defines as the gospel. Precisely. And so this, I think, in the scripture is uh, very important. And with that said, why don't we go to our first chart here. Now, to some of y'all who've been watching this long series of programs me and Rob have been doing, you've seen, no doubt seen this chart before, but we think it's important for new viewers and, and just to understand why this is so critically important. And uh, to go to this chart, uh, I'll just bring it up here now, and if uh, our viewers at home can take a look at this, what we have is something called the divine curse, it mentioned in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. In the New Testament, this was written by Paul. He was talking about a group of heretics, uh, Judaizers, and people that had come into the church and were adding other things to the gospel. Now, uh, Rob, could you go ahead and expound for our audience uh, this uh, passage of scripture and the importance it holds in our analysis of Roman Catholicism. Yes, Paul says that I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, when Paul says in verse 7, which is not another, he's trying to point out that there really is not another gospel. It's only that some Judaizers had crept in and they had added, they had perverted, they had brought along the Old Testament law to the gospel, and Paul was incensed that they would embrace this, which was not really another gospel, for the true gospel that he had brought to them. So he gives them a stern warning. He says, there are some that would trouble you and who would pervert the gospel of Christ, but though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel. That's inclusive. Any other gospel other than that which Paul preached needs to be reckoned with and dealt with. Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you. Let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. This is the strongest word for condemnation found in the New Testament. Are you saying like, let him go to hell? Absolutely. That's exactly Absolutely. what he's saying. Yes. The importance cannot be minimized. We are saying that the Roman Catholic religion has a gospel which really is not the gospel. It is another gospel, and it falls well short of the gospel that Paul preached, as we hope to point out, as we have been pointing out. And Paul repeats himself, 
as far as I know, the only time in all of scriptures where he preached himself, as we have said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So the importance of maintaining the proper gospel, of protecting the gospel that Paul preached, cannot be minimized, and that's what the issue is. That's the entirety of the issue. Mm -hmm. And those of you out there who are involved in the Catholic religion, uh, I simply can't emphasize this enough, and I, and I can't, and I don't want you to throw your arms around me and say, well, you're, we believe you're a Christian and you're a brother. And you're, that is not the issue. The issue is truth. What is the truth? What is the gospel that Paul preached? What's the gospel that is embedded in the New Testament? What's the truth of that gospel? And uh, if we can keep that in mind, then I think we can go through the Catholic religion and show that it does not have the gospel and therefore falls under the category of a perversion and is accursed and condemned by the great apostle. Right. Strong very, words. very serious indeed, especially if you out there take the Bible seriously. Uh, if some of you people, you know, I like this verse and I don't like that verse, you know, well, I guess you guys don't have to worry because you can just forget that you ever saw this verse. But now for those of us that really believe the word of God and, and the, the, the writers of the gospels uh, meant what they said and did what they said and, and, mm -hmm. and believed what they said and even died for what they said. Most Absolutely. of them were martyred. Uh, we have to take this very seriously, very seriously indeed. Now, uh, what we have on the other side of this chart, and I'll just flip it around here real quick, is uh, a little distinction here between the two. And uh, we've shown this on previous shows. And uh, I'll let Rob once again pick up the ball here and run with it and uh, just uh, touch on this and before we move into the main topic of our show. Right. The simplicity of the gospel is so startling that it meets with constant interruption and constant resistance. When given the record of the New Testament as to how a person can be saved and what is salvation, we come to the point where the simplicity of it must be emphasized. This is a recounting of the uh, scenario of the uh, Philippian jailer when faced with the, the question of salvation he asked the question, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. It's as simple as that. Uh, the faith in the finished work of Christ, the faith in what Christ has accomplished, trusting in the work he has done, his satisfaction, his redemption, is the requirement that the Bible places upon man for his salvation. Now, the Roman Catholic religion would answer this question quite a bit differently. When asked the same question, what must I do to be saved? They perhaps might say, keep the seven sacraments and other decrees of the church ordained by the Lord Jesus Christ and perhaps thou shalt be saved. Now you can see that this is entirely different because they have added to the simplicity of the gospel, the sacramental system of the Catholic Church, the rules, the decrees, the various labyrinths of works and details, traditions. and traditions, and they, they simply uh, have said that the Lord Jesus Christ has left that with us to do rather than faith and faith alone in his finished work. Now those two ideas contradict each other to such an extent that they both cannot be right. One is the gospel, one is not. And we've quoted Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. It's right. by faith, and it's the faith in the finished work of Christ, not faith in a religious labyrinth of a religion made by man. And that's the which, issue. Which really centers around works, doing works to gain your own salvation. Uh, but we all know that uh, grace is completely separate from works. If I uh, work at a job, then I've earned my pay. But uh, if I don't do any works, and let's say somebody just lays a million dollars on me, uh, I just receive some great mercy and grace for nothing I did at all in my own self. He just handed it to me. But if I work like a dog for you know 40 hours and punch my, uh, my time clock card, and that, that guy owes me, and it's not grace when he hands me the money. I mean, uh, I'll mm -hmm. take him to court if he doesn't pay, pay my wages. So uh, there's a big difference between working for your salvation 
and having salvation by grace. And to just back this up, we have one last verse on this chart down at the bottom here. I don't know if the camera can pick it up. It doesn't matter all that much. It's just a scripture reference. It's uh, Galatians uh, chapter 2, verse 16 here. And I'll just read that real quick out of the uh, book of Galatians. It says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And if you go on, if you've got your Bible out there and you happen to look up some of these verses me and Rob are talking about, if you go down to the end of that chapter in Galatians chapter 2, you see in verse 21 it says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Right there, if you're trying to work, instead of uh, taking advantage of the grace of God, mm -hmm. then uh, Christ died in vain, because then it's no more grace. I'd like to comment on that if I could. If, uh, if you're a Roman Catholic and you happen to be watching this video out there and you say, well, maybe we've got a point, and you have a Bible open, and if you were to go to your priest right now and say, Galatians 2.16 and 2.21 seem to teach a salvation by faith. No works. The answer you're going to get from your Roman Catholic priest is that Paul was only talking about the Old Testament works of the law. He wasn't talking about New Testament obediences. He wasn't talking about Catholic works. He wasn't talking about the works that we do to please God in our religion, the works that Christ gave us to do. Your answer to that, and my answer to that, and the Bible's response to that, is that Paul never anywhere restricts works of law to only the Old Testament law. Also, Titus chapter 3, verse 5 states specifically that all works are excluded. Romans chapter 4 states specifically the same. Those two passages must be taken with the two we've already mentioned. We are well aware that Roman Catholic priests and scholars and apologists and bishops deny works salvation by saying that obeying Jesus for salvation is not really works, but it really is, and it's an offense to the gospel, and just because they're Catholic works and just because they are calling them new covenant works does not minimize what Paul is saying no works, no Catholic works, no law works, no Old Testament works, no uh, man-made works at all can be used to justify you before God. Very well said, Rob. Well, with that, I think it's time to finally get to the topic of today's program. All right. We've uh, gone through a lot of territory in this long series on Roman Catholicism. Uh, but it, it really does merit this kind of attention with almost, what, a uh, sixth of the Earth's population involved mm -hmm. in Roman Catholicism? Mm -hmm. uh, almost a billion people, I believe. And so uh, this really deserves the kind of attention we're trying to give to it. Uh, well, today's topic, to finally get around to it uh, in a more specific way on Roman Catholicism, is the Roman priesthood and all that entails, maybe indulgences, penance, all the rest of that stuff. We've covered a lot of this in previous shows, but I'm sure there's some out there that haven't caught all our shows, so this will be new to you. But uh, what we've done is uh, we've put a new chart up, and uh, we're going to start looking at what the Roman Catholic Church says about their priest and how important this priest is in their overall scheme, their overall plan of salvation. And uh, Rob, you can read just as good or better than I can. Uh, why don't you start giving a, a detailed analysis here for our viewers at home from this chart, and we'll start looking at what the Roman church says about their priests and then uh, go into uh, more okay. in-depth analysis from there. Yes, let's take a look at the uh, priest defined up here. A priest is a man who primarily offers sacrifice to God for the sins of the people. There have always been priests, both in the true religion and in false religions even in pagan religions. Why? Because people have always felt the need of having someone to offer sacrifice to Almighty God for their sins. Now, I just want to highlight this for you. This definition is given to us, by the way, from instruction in the Catholic faith. And what we, what we see here is that the Roman Catholic religion believes 
that a priesthood is necessary to offer sacrifices to God for sins of the people, to offer sacrifice to Almighty God for their sins, and have delegated or relegated this responsibility to certain men in their religion whereby these priests are responsible for performing actual sacrifices for the forgiveness of sin. Now you might ask, well, where is the sacrifice performed? We covered the sacrifice performed when we talked about the Mass. Mm -hmm. The priest is the one who offers up the Lord Jesus Christ in an unbloody sacrifice at Mass, and it is said to be for the satisfaction of God, for the propitiation of sin, and in doing this, the priest is said to have authority and power to appease God through this offering of Jesus Christ again in sacrifice so that sins may be forgiven. Now this is the heart of Romanism. You take away the Roman Catholic priest, there is no Romanism anymore. And it goes deeper, Larry, into the heart of Roman Catholic thinking as far as the cross of Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sin. Mm -hmm. And if I could just uh, for a moment stay right here and uh, explain this a little bit more carefully. The Roman Catholic religion is devoted to the prospect that Jesus Christ came, died on the cross, and left us with a religion, and that religion must have priests, and the priests are to uh, perform various functions. Among these functions are the sacrificing of Christ over and over again in the Mass for the forgiveness of sin. Now, if there's no need for this, then there'll be no need for the Roman Catholic religion. There'll be no need for the priesthood or, or any of the uh, various ordinances, rituals, sacramental systems, mm -hmm. so forth, because uh, the, without a priest, these sacraments mean nothing. And what we need to do is just go right to the heart of the matter and say that the priesthood doesn't make any sense because the death of Jesus Christ is sufficient. We don't need a priesthood anymore. We have access to God through Christ's death and that death alone. He does not have to be sacrificed anymore and we do not have to go through a priesthood. So mm -hmm. fundamentally, what's wrong with the priesthood starts at the Roman Catholic understanding of the death of Jesus Christ. They have a faulty understanding of his work, his death, and what that death accomplished. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they have left us with a, a religion. And the religion is replete with the priest. And we're going to concentrate on what Catholics mm -hmm. think of their priest and I, how they define that's their right. priest. That's right. I would like to tell our viewers, just since you mentioned it, that we have done an in-depth show on the Roman Mass uh, earlier in the series, and that was show number two mm -hmm. in our series, in case anyone wants to go back and try to find that. Uh, Rob did an outstanding job in an analysis of that. Uh, we can't spend all our time on the Roman Mass, but it's, uh, it's an incredible thing. But we're going to find out here how important a priest is in all that, as you've just explained. Mm. Well, uh, please continue, Rob, uh, as uh, yes, we go here, through this. Here are a few uh, sentences on uh, statements of what the Roman Catholic religion thinks of their priests. Uh, for instance, he is said to be a king. That is in the sense of reigning not over unwilling subjects, but over the hearts and affections of his people. Roman Catholic priest has a lot of authority, a lot of control over the local church, the local parish. So much so that people are convinced that if they have a religious question or if they have any information they need from the Bible, go ask the priest. The priest will tell them whatever the priest says. Although I know from personal experience years ago when I wasn't saved but I was dating my now wife, but back then it was just dating, but she went to a Roman Catholic church and I had some interest in the Bible. I know when I ask them certain questions, I didn't seem to get too good answers, at least from the priests I ask. <laughs> Uh, specific. They seem to know more about psychology than uh, Bible verses, but uh, that, that's just personal experience. That's not to say that's like that in every case. But go ahead. He's said to be a shepherd because he leads his flock into the delicious pastures of the sacraments and shelters them from the wolves that lie in wait for their souls. The priest is responsible for performance of the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. He's involved in baptism. He's involved in confirmation, although the bishop confirms he's involved in it. He's involved in the marriage ceremony. He's involved in the, the penance and forgiveness of sin, the confessional. The, everything centers around the local parish priest and 
the authority that he is said to have. He is called the Father because he breaks the bread of life to his spiritual children whom he has begotten in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now we know the scripture says we're to call none Father. Mm -hmm. And here the Roman Catholic religion uses this title, Father, and uh, I was talking with a Roman Catholic once uh, who doesn't attend the Catholic Church uh -huh. anymore, and I was asking him, what exactly took you away from the Roman Catholic religion? And his response was, I kept thinking we're to call no one Father, and yet here's this man who kept wanting me to call him Father. Now this man didn't know much about the Bible, but he had been told by a Christian you're not supposed to call anybody father. And that was the one thing that stuck. So perhaps there's some of you out there that uh, are a little bit worried about calling a man your father who's not your father and elevating him to a position that he doesn't rightfully hold, and especially when the fact that the Bible says we're to call nobody father. Let that stick a little bit and uh, review the Roman Catholic priesthood with us as it's uh, going. He is said to be a judge whose office uh, it is to pass sentence of pardon on self-accusing criminals. Now this idea of the priest being a judge and passing a sentence of pardon, that leads us into the whole arena of penance mm -hmm. and uh, the whole region, uh, regions of indulgences. Mm -hmm. Now perhaps now you're, we'll, you're we'll come back to You're talking about going into, the, well you're, just briefly, you're talking about going to uh, like a confessional, mm -hmm. going to a priest and saying, uh, oh father I've, I've sinned, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and if it's a really bad sin, like maybe a mortal sin, mm -hmm. uh, what well, he'll make you do some kind of act of penance, like uh, what say ten Hail Marys or uh, or do the Rosary fifty times or something. Mm -hmm. This is what we're talking about in something like this. Is that what? We're, right. Is that what? Am I correct in that? Right, you are. The the Roman Catholic uh, formula for confession, at least it used to be. I'm not sure what it is now, but it used to be, "Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been so many days since my last confession. My sins are." And then the idea is that you repeat your sins to the, to the Catholic priest who hears them and then grants forgiveness of those sins based upon the authority of, of his position in the Roman Catholic religion. But it's not without a catch. Mm -hmm. For even though the guilt of those sins are forgiven by the Roman Catholic priest based upon this assumed authority, yet those sins must be expiated as far as temporal punishment is concerned. And that is the, doc the uh, Roman Catholic doctrine of penance, wherein the priest will assign to the person confessing his sin a number of things that he may do uh, temporally to be relieved from the punishment of his sins. And it normally is in the form of doing penance, whether it's praying a rosary, Bead or, or being involved in the Stations of the Cross or being involved in some good work that the Roman Catholic religion will give you, there's always the satisfaction that has to be paid by the person doing the confession. And the priest has this authority and this power. That's because he's the judge. Because he's and the he judge. judges their sin and what they must do to make up for it. Exactly. And doesn't it, Larry, go back to a fundamental misunderstanding of the death of Jesus Christ? Exactly. If I could get this point through to, to Roman Catholics, it is a fundamental misunderstanding. Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and satisfied the wrath of God. He satisfied all that God needed to forgive unworthy sinners like you and like me. And we do not need to continually sacrifice Christ and we do not need to continually pay the price ourselves for our sins. We don't need to do penance for forgiveness of sin. And it's, uh, it's an, this grieves me. This judge, he's the judge. The idea, and see, with judge comes control. Mm -hmm. And the priest has absolute sway and control in local congregation. I'll well, tell you the truth, all of it grieves me. Uh -huh. <laughs> <But> go ahead. <laughs> I know. He is said to be a physician because he heals their souls from the loathsome distempers of sin. This grieves me. There's only one physician, the great physician, the Lord Jesus Christ. A Roman Catholic priest cannot do this. A Roman Catholic has no power or authority to heal He's just spiritual. A man. He's just a man. He's just a man. Absolutely. He is said to be a mediator between God and man, especially one who has received holy orders and takes the place of Christ, the high priest. Now this uh, is again a fundamental misunderstanding of the priestly work of Jesus Christ. 
Only Jesus Christ is the high priest. Only he has died in the place of unworthy sinners. Only he has offered himself as a perfect sacrifice. But the Roman Catholic religion insists over and over again that their priests stand in the place of Christ. They become altar Christus, another Christ, and in doing so they are given the authority to be the mediator between God and man. And we reject all this based upon the sure word of God. And for those of you who are out there listening, please understand that we're, we're not here to bash Roman Catholics or to try to subdue you or to, to uh, in any way uh, minimize your sincerity. What we're trying to do is drive home the point that the religion that you believed in does not have a foundation in Scripture, cannot pass the test of scriptural analysis, and because of that, you are in a bondage that needs to be uh, examined, and uh, you need relief from that. And this is right. what we're trying to do. And all this, of course, contradicts point blank scriptures like uh, the whole chapter of Hebrews chapter 7. I mean, it's all about Jesus being the, the great high priest with an untransferable priesthood. Absolutely. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.5, where Jesus is the only mediator between mm -hmm. God and man. But, but anyway, go ahead, brother. Right. We're uh, number 4.4 4 here. The priest enters the scene sent by God to fulfill the anguished need of men. He is present in the church always. He is, with the Holy Spirit, the enduring source of her life. Well, that might be true if you put Roman Catholic Church because the priest is the enduring source of her life, not the enduring source of Christianity, though. Not the enduring source of, of uh, what God came to give to men by way of free grace and what Christ has accomplished and completed at the cross. Now, what happens if you take all the priests out of Roman Catholicism? What if suddenly they have no priests? Without the priesthood, there's no religion. There's no so the whole Roman Catholic religious structure stands or falls on these men that they call priests. Right. So without them, they're, they're just up the creek. Here's a good illustration, if you can remember it. If I gave Larry here a check for $1 million, and I said, Larry, I want you to give it to your wife when you get home. Well, because just take it. <laughs> no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this to you for $1 million, and, and I want you, you, you to give it to your wife because it's my free gift to her. I just mm -hmm. want you to go and tell her I've given her this. Now, if you took that million-dollar check and you put it in the bank and you said, I've got a better idea, <laughs> I'm going to tell my wife that there's a million dollars available to her if she does <laughs> what I tell her to do. And then you start parceling it out to her, piece by piece, bit by bit, mm -hmm. until she nibbles away at it based upon her performance. That's the Roman Catholic religion. That You become the Roman Catholic priest. You dispense it piecemeal based upon your determination of how well your congregation has performed. Penance. Mm -hmm. Obligations of holy days involvement in the parish activities, money, giving. You're the one that dispenses Just it. Just like in your example, if I don't like what, you know, if my wife didn't cook me a good enough meal, I won't give her some of that money that day. You know, she has to cook a better meal and, and mop those floors, and right. maybe I'll give her a little bit of that money. Right. And so. this is, you see, this is another gospel. Uh, the tragedy of it all is that this is another gospel. The, the gospel says that, that grace is free. And it's a free gift of God. And we cannot earn it through new covenant obediences or old covenant obediences. And there's no man that stands between you and God. There's only the Savior, Jesus Christ. And no man can tell you to perform in order to get into heaven. Now, Roman Catholic theologians would argue, this is what Christ has left us to do. And we would say, absolutely not. Christ has not left us a system with priests. He's left us himself and his word, and therein lies the difference. Number five, a priest is a man drawn from the ranks of the people of God to be made in the very depths of his being like to Christ, the priest of mankind. Well, I think this citation from uh, Vatican II is given to us to show that nothing has changed. You can't appeal to Vatican II. 
You can't say, oh, Vatican II changed all of that. Vatican II changed nothing. The priesthood is still in force. The doctrine of penance is still in force. This re-sacrificing of Christ continually wait, is still wait, in force. Are you force. saying that this right here hasn't changed anything about what we're talking about today or in all these other shows we've done? Absolutely. On all these, Absolutely. It, it's just, uh, to me, uh, Vatican II, I think, uh, has made things a little bit more uh, palatable. For people, yes, uh, but it doesn't change anything. It just makes it sound a little bit better, right? Interesting. I would encourage all of you Roman Catholics to pick up a copy, uh, either uh, the study guide that Larry has or this Vatican collection of the Vatican Council, Vatican II, and read it. Uh, very readable, easy to understand, and uh, upon reading it, you will see that all of the doctrines that have been uh, developed over the years in Roman Catholicism have been retained and really amplified in Vatican II. We say Rome never changes. It may expand itself, it may use new language, but their doctrines are set in concrete and they won't change. Other than maybe the peripheral ones like canonization of St. Christopher or something right, like that. Right, right. <laughs> and we're going to find out uh, in, a, in another program that uh, Vatican II, as it uh, speaks to other religions and as it expands the gospel to ecumenicalism, right is going to contradict earlier church councils. So you'll see even though their doctrine on penance and priests, that won't change, their ideology towards other religions has changed. And uh, we'll have that in another program. But we can move down to number six here. Thus priests are gods in power. Wow, that's uh, quite a mouthful. Power and dignity of the priesthood which surpasses all powers of heaven and earth second only to the ineffable dignity of the mother of God. Well, this, this is absolute heresy right here. This quote here, the priest is dignity and obligations by uh, John Ennard. This is, uh, this is a, a highlight perhaps of the astronomical uh, folly of Rome in giving men this kind of authority, which uh, we, we deny. The it's scriptures interesting though, he, he gives someone, someone else a little bit of authority there too that uh, Oh, here's my pointer. The mother of God. And uh, so he gives priests are gods in power, but yet uh, this mother of God idea seems to be even more exalted than this exalted idea, which uh, leaves you wondering, man, there's a lot of, it's crowded up there near deity, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. And we have done a so, program on uh, Mary. And right. The, right. The, the I forgot effort. what number that right. was. Right. <laughs> it was somewhere back yeah. there. It continues on. Right. On and on. So uh, with that said, let's... Uh, roll on to our next chart. It's time flies in this program, brother. Now this is kind of a, a reaffirmation. Oh, actually, I better turn it around to this side first, and then uh, we'll go. This kind of repeats a lot of what you just went through, brother. Uh, for our audience at home, we just put a new chart up, uh, just kind of reiterating what was just said and just kind of uh, expanding on a little from the scriptures. What we have here up at the top, of course, is the Roman priest, and then uh, as uh, Rob just uh, very well went through the Romanist titles for the priest, and uh, we, we find that as Rob was talking about the priest being known as a king, a shepherd, another uh, Christ, uh, the father, judge, physician, mediator. He's uh, called the need of man. He's like Christ. Vatican II talks about that. Uh, priests are gods, just as you said. But in contrast to that, we find when we start looking in the scriptures, where we find some of these terms. We don't find these terms being applied to some man, as we have just discussed a moment ago. We find them being applied to, like here in 1 Timothy 1, uh, verse 17, and also in 1 Timothy 6, verses 15 and 16, if you're at home. You might want to write these down and look them up later, or, uh, or if you're taping this off the television, videotaping it, you can check these references. Uh, you know, after the show's over, you go back and rewind the tape and take a look at these. But we find that these are titles given to God Himself. Jesus called a King of Kings mm -hmm. and the Lord of Lords. And yet here, this title is given to a man, a priest. Uh, also, shepherd, as we, I mentioned earlier in the show already, John 10, it, uh, Jesus is called the Good Shepherd. Uh, another Christ. Uh, I found this interesting here. Uh, there's only one Christ in the Bible, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the monogenes, and uh, the only begotten of the mm -hmm. Father. And he has that uh, distinct title of the Messiah. And uh, in the scriptures that we look in, uh, like uh, Matthew 24, 24, 
uh, it, it talks about there'll be uh, other Christ, or if there's a, someone out in the wilderness that says, lo, there's Christ, or here's Christ, mm. and there's false prophets and, and, and other Christ. Well, that just reminds me of Jesus' warning that uh, there'll be men coming along claiming to be Christ. Uh, you also get this in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. And I also have this in uh, contrast to the Romanist titles up here at the top of the chart. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, it says, He that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted. He goes on to condemn people that accept another Jesus, and we already saw from all these titles that the Roman Catholic priest is considered to be like another Jesus, like mm -hmm. another Christ. Uh, he has all the titles of God bestowed on him. Uh, he, he's even called like a God mm -hmm. in one of those references we mm -hmm. had. Uh, and we find in 2 Corinthians 11, 4, there's uh, another Jesus, another spirit. And we believe that there's the, the, this is an antichrist type of spirit. Mm -hmm. This isn't the spirit of Christ we're seeing here. This is an antichrist spirit because it contradicts the Bible. <laughs> it's as simple as that. As you look in the scriptures, you don't find all that stuff. The, the titles they give to the priest are actually the titles given to God in the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's and, a good point. We, we need to really focus in on that for just a second, that, that when, the, when the word priest is used in the New Testament, it's, called, it's used in the sense of priest of believers that all who are in Christ, all who are Christian, who bear the name Christian, are a priesthood. Peter, said to be the first pope by Rome in his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, talks about a priesthood of believers, a royal priesthood. And when this term is used in this sense in the New Testament, it's talking about those who are the hagias, the sanctified, the set-apart ones, Christians. When it is used Elsewhere in the Bible, it's always in reference to that which is fading away, that which is past. It's always used in reference to the Old Testament priests or in reference to the Old Covenant law. Now, Jesus Christ is the high priest who has come, and he has fulfilled and done away with all of the Old Testament priestly functions, and now we are a royal priesthood, family of God, being built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Well, and you have a lot of so, re cross references to that, uh, like in I turned it turned to it right while you were talking about that uh, other reference, uh, right here in uh, Revelation chapter one verse six, it says, "And hath made us kings and priests unto God, mm -hmm. and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen." Right. Uh, so the saints of God, the true believers, those born from above believers, as mentioned in John chapter three. Those are the, every, it's the priesthood of believers. Mm -hmm. Any true believer in Christ is a priest unto God. You don't have to go take holy orders. You don't have to go do a bunch of works and rites and take all these studies or go to seminary or whatever it is. You're declared to be a priest unto God mm -hmm. the moment you believe. Absolutely. You've been baptized or in the Holy Spirit. You're born again. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, right, and the and the only the only sacrifice that that a priest in the New Testament is involved in is a living sacrifice, presenting right. ourselves as living sacrifices right. unto God, which are pleasing to God, and uh, the, which is the, our reasonable service. Which is our reasonable service, right? Romans so, uh, chapter twelve. Exactly. So, w when considering all of all of what Romanism does, they have to have this because Jesus Christ did not do it all. Mm -hmm. But in their minds, what he did do was leave a priestly caste system to mediate and to, to be involved in the actual salvation of people. And we deny it from the uh, sure word of God, New Testament revelation. That's right. That's right. And just to pick up where I left off a moment ago, just to finish off this particular chart we're looking at, uh, as you, you can see, we, the scripture references as given here, the father here and and over here, in, uh, you know, we have Matthew 23, uh, verse 9, in contradiction to uh, that. Uh, we have uh, Judge here in John 5, uh, 27. We have mm -hmm. Physician. We have over here Matthew 9, 12. I'm just mentioning this uh, so you all can uh, look them up at your leisure. But uh, these should be some good contrasts for you. Mediator, 
Uh, of course, we mentioned this one earlier in the show already, 1 Timothy 2.5, about Jesus is the mediator between God and man. Not this priest over here, but Jesus himself. Uh, the need of man. Of course, uh, Jeremiah 17.5 says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be uh, the man that trusteth, trusteth in man and make it flesh his arm. Mm -hmm. So if you trust in some man, like the priest, you're in real trouble. <laughs> you need to put your, put your trust in the great high priest, which is Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm. Not that man wearing uh, the white collar or whatever it is around his neck. Black collar. Black collar. and uh, collar. There you go. Uh, and uh, over here, like Christ, Vatican II, as we said, but in, uh, in Romans 8, 28 and following, it says, all believers are to be conformed to the image of Christ. And uh, so we uh, pattern our lives after Jesus Christ and live according to what he would have us to do. And you don't need some priest over there that's supposed to be Christ on earth for you. Each person is a priest unto God and lives in conforming his life through sanctification. Mm -hmm. That's a theological term. Mm -hmm. We don't have time to explain it all here, but, uh, but uh, that's in con contradiction to what their terminology is for this priest. And, of course, I believe anyone that this kind of definition of a priest being like Christ is more of an antichrist mm. definition mm. as we find uh, in Timothy for instance and also in 1 John chapter 4 about antichrist but anyway and then of course down here number 10 priests are gods and of course over here we find in 1 Corinthians 8 5 and 6 that there's many many are called there, there's many things called uh, gods and lords gods many and lords many mm -hmm. but unto us there's only one god mm -hmm. and uh, also in galatians 2 6 it talks about uh, there's there's people that have a high reputation but the apostle it, it didn't seem important you know means uh, that, nothing to him right, right. It means nothing that this guy's got these high titles and everything you know because mm -hmm. we're, we're all one in christ when you're a true believer mm -hmm. you know uh, now, that's not talking about false prophets in this case, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's another thing. And of course, down here at the bottom of the chart, the, the, to try to justify these, this terminology and these functions of the Romanist priesthood, they come up with uh, verses like uh, Acts 14.22, 1 uh, Timothy 5.22, 1 Timothy 4.14 and James 5.14. I'm not going to go into those verses, but I have a feeling that if you just look up what they quote, you'll find that it has nothing to do with, the, with, with what the, they're making this priest out to be mm -hmm. biblically. I mean, it has nothing to do, but these are the verses they give to try to justify these doctrines we've been talking about. And of course, to refute all this, all you have to do is go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, read uh, verses 1 through 13. It gives you the definition of elders and deacons mm -hmm. and so forth of what a, a true man of God, a leader of a church would be like. And you, you know, the husband of one wife, I think uh, priests uh, mm -hmm. have a real trouble with that one right there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they can't even have a wife. So uh, they, they've got problems already in what it takes to lead a congregation as uh, defined by the scriptures themselves right here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. So mm -hmm. uh, check that out at your leisure uh, when you can. Now, uh, Rob, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the other side of this chart mm -hmm. where we have uh, some additional duties of the priest, the Roman Catholic priest. You had mentioned a couple at the beginning. And right, I'd, like, of them. I'd like to, to focus in on the, the power to forgive sins, if I could. And uh, I'm not sure how much time we have left in, in this program. We have about but eight minutes, nine okay, minutes. Okay, we better move along quickly here. The power to forgive sins. In all of my studying of the Roman Catholic religion and all of the work I've done, this is the one aspect of Romanism which is the height of idolatry and which really qualifies it most as a false gospel and a false representation of Jesus Christ. This idea of power to forgive sins. And in order to arrive at this, you, those of you in the listening audience have to understand that Roman Catholic theologians read the Bible and they, and they draw this, as you were showing, from peculiar and particular passages of the Bible. And in doing this, they arrive at these outlandish doctrines and dogmas. One of the most outlandish is this one. And I'd like to just briefly explain their thinking on this and then give a short refutation of it. In the Roman Catholic religion, there is what we call a bifurcation of terminology, a splitting of ter terminology. It's taking a word and having it mean something different from what the scriptures would have that word mean in a normal flow of reading the scripture. And one of the things that they do is they like to separate 
redemption from salvation. And they like to separate propitiation or satisfaction from salvation. They like to separate reconciliation from salvation. So in a Catholic world, you can be redeemed but not saved. You can be reconciled to God but not saved. God can be propitiated, that is satisfied, the word propitiate means satisfied, but you are not necessarily saved. And when this happens, it builds up a system of religion. And in that system of religion, there needs to be a way to get you saved. So, for instance, a Roman Catholic theologian will say, Jesus Christ died on the cross and he redeemed all of mankind. But to get saved, you have to go through this system and that's where the priest comes in. The priest will tell you what the system is and he'll get involved in their system. So you can be redeemed but not saved unless you go through the Catholic system. The Roman Catholic will come along and say, Jesus Christ's death on the cross reconciled the world unto himself. But in order to be saved, you have to go through the system. He'll say, Jesus Christ died on the cross and God was satisfied. The wrath of God was satisfied with the death of his dear son. But in order to be saved, you have to go through the system. And in comes this army of priests to take their people through the system. Now, Christians, of course, believe that when a person is redeemed, he is saved. When a person is reconciled to God, he is saved. And when, when God is satisfied, propitiated, then that person is saved. He Happy is, is in a man relation. Who's, uh, who, whom God does not impute Exactly. Sin. Romans 4. Happy man. So the, the, here we see the, the heart of Romanism exposed in a theological sense at this point. And uh, I just want to quote uh, for the audience here the uh, Council of Trent as it talks about what God has left us to do. This is very revealing. The Council, that is the Council of Trent, official Catholic teaching, teaches the liberality of divine generosity is so great that we are able through Jesus Christ to make satisfaction to God the Father not only by punishments voluntarily undertaken by ourselves to atone for our sins, but by those imposed by the judgment of the priest according to the measure of our offense and also by the temporal afflictions imposed by God himself. So, the Roman Catholic religion says this, God is so great, he is so wonderful, his generosity extends to such a great degree that he allows his people to suffer expiation for their own sins, to pay the penalty for what the priests have given us to do, and also to suffer temporally at the hand of God. Now, wait a minute, And they Rob. call this... Wait, wait a minute, Rob. I thought uh, uh, Jesus paid for all our sins. That's I mean, he point. paid for all of them. Are you saying that, well, there's some sins that Jesus didn't pay for, and through this Roman Catholic system, you have to pay for those sins yourself? Yes, that's precisely what I'm saying. But so I'm he wasn't good enough. Jesus wasn't good enough to pay. You have, you're good enough to get rid of some of your sins, but Jesus wasn't good enough to get rid of some of your sins. Yes, that's what the Roman Catholic religion teaches, but it's deeper than that. They say not only has has God delivered this unto us, but it's good that he has done this. This is favorable. This is God's benefit to you. It's like me saying to you, Larry, here's what I'm going to do for you. I love you so much, I'm going to allow you to pay for your own sins. I love you so much, I'm going to allow a priest to tell you how much penance you have to do for the forgiveness of your sins. And I love you so much, I'm going to give you some suffering here on earth to pay for your own sins. And they have the audacity... And if to I don't do a good enough job, I have to suffer some more in purgatory. Purgatory, exactly. Right. And they have the audacity to, to say that the liberality of divine generosity is so great that through Jesus Christ, we get to do this. Now, this is beyond the comprehension of any Christian in the world. How you can say that the generosity of God is so great he, that he, he allows you. He, uh, suffer so, yeah, it sense. sounds like he's generous in dealing out punishment and suffering instead of free grace where Precisely. we can go into the presence of God Precisely. Uh, through the shed blood of Christ. Precisely. So Precisely. Well, well made point there, brother. I hope uh, you, you people out there are paying attention to some of this stuff uh, because uh, it is really critical and vital to the heart of the gospel itself as presented in the scripture. 
Mm, now with that, where time's almost out, I just want to run through this chart. We won't have time to go into it all, but just to finish this off here uh, for our viewers, we only had a couple of minutes left. Um, uh, the, the power of the Roman Catholic priest, just briefly, he offers sacrifice of Christ in Mass. You talked about that. He has power to forgive sins. You had a good point on that, uh, well made. Uh, point three, power to preach the gospel. Of course, when we read the scripture, any Christian has the power to preach the gospel. But we need to back uh, up here. He won't preach the gospel. He that preaches we know. another gospel. He preach, which is not the gospel. Galatians at all. chapter exactly one, as right. we started with. Right. Okay, uh, uh, number four, power to change bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Now, that's pretty good power if you can turn a piece of bread and wine into God Himself, but that's another story. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, number five, sacrament of anointing of sick. Uh, six, power to perform marriages. Seven, power to bless people and things. I guess that's like blessing water and turning it into holy mm -hmm. water. Or you, you can get, to, you know, you can pay a priest to do certain things. And of course, he's known as a father and a teacher and provides for salvation for man, for sin, as you talked about. Exactly. Well, brother, we're just about out of time. We have about a minute to go. I would like uh, in that minute, brother, to have you give a heart-to-heart -heart talk with our viewers out there in the Tell them the gospel and how they can come to know Jesus Christ without all this uh, slavery, uh, a bondage to a false religious system. There's bound to be several people who watch this video who will be saying, I don't know, I'm uncertain, I was raised Catholic, it was good enough for my parents, my grandparents, my priest says something different than what this man is saying. I don't think I can read the Bible. I don't think I can understand it. I, I don't, I'm not going to school for this and, and on and on. Let me just cut through all of that and say this. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for sinners such as you and me. And he has asked nothing more than to place your faith and your confidence in his work and to go to him for forgiveness of sin. He has forbidden you to seek your salvation in the religion of men. Any person can do this, and I beg of you to give yourself up to Christ, repent, and go to Christ. Thank you, brother. I hope you take these things to heart. We're not out here trying to be mean to anybody. We just want people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ as presented in the scriptures. We do that. We're trying to speak the truth and love, uh, having no malice toward any man. But with that, our time's up. Uh, if you'd like more information, please uh, call our number or write our address at the end of the program. Uh, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. In his name, amen. Thank you for watching this Christian Answers of Austin, Texas presentation. For other shows in this 16-hour series on the religion of Roman Catholicism, please type the following words in the YouTube search box, Larry Wessel's Roman Catholicism. Other shows in this series include the Roman Mass, Roman Catholic Inventions, Vatican II, Roman Doctrine of Mary, Purgatory, Roman Doctrine of the Pope, Roman Catholic Apologists, Scripture Twisting, The Roman Priesthood, Roman Style Universalism, and others. Besides this series, Christian Answers also has various debates with Roman Catholic spokesmen such as Does Romanism Preach Another Gospel Debate, Debate with a Monsignor, Indulgences Debate, Virgin Mary Debate, Papal Infallibility Debate, and several others. Remember to gain free access to all these video presentations simply by typing Larry Wessel's Roman Catholicism in the YouTube search box. Thank you. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 